Hey guys, this is Will from Monkey Steals Peach here. So I've just finished my 14 days of quarantine because of um, traveling interstate. So today I've finally been led out back into the world and I thought I'd come out to Kings Park and um, connect with nature a little bit. And also, you know, I was thinking like during my time in quarantine, um, besides doing a hell of a lot of training and study, I was also like looking through my old photos and videos and stuff from like, my early days in China and I was getting quite nostalgic about, you know, the different adventures I had. So I thought for this video, um, I would share like some stories of some of the teachers that I met and trained with before I um, started training Mantis with my teacher Zhou Zhendong. So this was a period, I guess, where I would say that I was still kind of finding myself in China in that I, I was just starting to get to grips with the language. I, I was just learning to speak Chinese. Sorry about the wind. Guys, it's pretty windy today. Um, so I would say this was like a stage where I was still kind of finding myself in China, like I was still getting to grips with the language, I was still trying to find a teacher and, and trying to, you know, um, figure out how to um, learn martial arts properly. So it's kind of, yeah, I guess the early stages or the formative stages of, of my time in China. So the very first teacher that I met was actually just within literally a couple of weeks of landing in China. So when I first moved to China, I went to Xi'an, which is the ancient capital of China. Um, and I was doing this volunteer program where I was helping um, the staff at Xi'an City Museum with their English. And one of the girls who I was helping, she was a Buddhist. And after um, work or volunteer work, whatever you want to call it, one morning uh, she wanted to take me to this Buddhist temple and so we're at this temple and I like yeah I didn't really speak any Chinese at the time but we, we met this monk we started chatting to him obviously through her translating and he said he was originally from the Shaolin temple and that he'd gone through all like the martial arts training and everything um, but he'd relocated here to Xi'an so first thing he had me do was horse stance pretty much i mean this was literally like something out of the movies right i've got this this shaolin monk in the in the middle of this buddhist temple like right in front of the shrine teaching me you know horse stance just making me stand there in horse stance for absolutely ages and there's you know um, people coming and praying in front of the shrines tourists are coming and taking photos and i'm just there like an idiot stood in this horse stance for absolutely ages, legs shaking, can barely stand up, and then he's just sat at the side playing chess with another monk. And then, yeah, he started to teach me some other stances, um, basic kicks, basic, basic punches, just like the real sort of classic or like bread and butter of, of northern kung fu. I wouldn't even say Shaolin specific. And I didn't have any translator so there was no way we could really communicate. He would just show me some movement, make me do it and then just kind of leave me to it. And he was very impatient, not particularly nice guy. Um, I remember one time he was showing me something and he was like trying to correct my hand position or something. So he stood pretty close to me and he just burps right in my face and it absolutely stunk of garlic. It was the most disgusting thing ever. So I trained with him for, I don't know, a couple of months, maybe a month or so, six to eight weeks. I can't exactly remember, but um, then that girl came to me and said, oh, you, you need to stop going to see that monk. He's a very bad person. He's not, he's not a genuine monk. He's not good or something and I mean she was a very traditional girl so she didn't really go into details she just basically said that he was like drunk or something and he was phoning her up and saying lots of nasty things like, I don't know what kinds of things she wouldn't tell me but yeah it, she was pretty distraught by it so I just never went back to the guy after that and then it, on that same trip after I left Xi'an I went down to Hong Kong I spent um, a, a short time in Hong Kong. So 
So because, as I say, I'd done Wing Chun for several years back in the UK, you know, Hong Kong's like the mecca of Wing Chun, right? It's, it's where sort of all Wing Chun practitioners have got to go, I suppose, at least once, right? But I thought, you know, I'm not going to go with just the normal, you know, Yip Man Wing Chun, which is what I've been doing. I wanted to do something a little bit different, so I ended up just purely by chance um, coming across a blog post talking about, um, I think it was a Canadian guy, who'd been to train with this guy called Kwok Kwan Ping, who was teaching, and sorry my Cantonese, I'm not even going to try and do it in proper Cantonese pronunciation, you're going to have Lao Wai, Lao Wai Chinese now. Um, but yeah, so Kwok Kwan Ping, he was a, a teacher of Yun Kei San, lineage of Wing Chun, which is very, very different to the commonly see Yip Man stuff. Um, so I think, yeah, and that's also, I think, when I started to, I uh, had my first sort of online presence. I uploaded a few videos onto YouTube. It was a, not, the, not this channel now, it was a different channel I had um, back in the day, but I have re-uploaded those videos um, to this channel since, like, and even back then they got like several hundred thousand views each or something. And that was just me doing some really basic Wing Chun stuff with Kwok Kwan Ping. Um, and he was a really, really interesting guy. At this point, I spoke some Mandarin. Um, and he was also fluent in Mandarin because he was born in mainland China, grew up in mainland China. And then he fled to Hong Kong um, in the 60s during the Cultural Revolution. So, yeah, we were able to communicate in Mandarin. And... Um, yeah, we, we spent most of the time just doing a lot of sticky hands and he just had immense power. And he was very different as well because a lot of the Wing Chun that I'd done, you know, back in the UK, there's all this sort of, you know, talk of angles and you kind of move around off to 45 degrees and, you know, the footwork and the way you come in is very important and a lot of technicalities. But he would just stand facing you square on, very rarely moved around just literally stood facing you and just as soon as you try to do anything just this immense shock of power and just bang and then straight away just knock you flying back and then you come back in same again bang just knock you flying back and so yeah I mean that that was a really I, I'd say that's one of the my top experiences that I've had uh, martial arts wise he was he was just so skilled and just had like, as I say such immense power and it was just exhausting as well because his arms just felt so heavy but he wasn't like, there wasn't sort of any any sort of tension or, or obvious force there, but just doing sticky hands with him was just exhausting because yeah, he just felt so, so damn heavy. Um, and I actually, I was so impressed with him that I went back the next year, um, in 2008, and I trained with him again. Um, unfortunately though, I've lost contact with um, his students, so. I mean, I would love to, to go and visit him again. I mean, he must be really old now. He was, he was already in his late 70s, maybe early 80s. I don't know his exact age, but he was already like really old um, when I went to train with him, but he was so healthy. He would, you know, besides the teaching and training martial arts, he'd go out and play basketball with the kids every day for several hours. So yeah, he, he was really good. I'd say he's one of the highlights of my, my martial arts experiences in China.